All right. Well, this is very exciting. Uh, for first of all, it, it, it was worth the price of admission to learn about Mary Lou's history. I cannot. That is so incredible, and to think of this place and, and I, I want to go back and see your performances. Um, I have a nine. I have a nine-year-old daughter, not necessarily. And then uh, wait till I tell uh, Laura and Erica about, I never knew this Kate and Carl about the favorite daughter, so I can't wait to get that in there. Okay, so we're, off the record. yeah, the whole thing's off the record, right. So uh, this is very exciting, first of all, to do this with my uh, beloved cousin Kate. We've been conspiring and uh, to ask our dad some questions. Uh, wow, a half hour, 40 minutes to talk about Growing up Jewish in Detroit, for somebody like me, uh, what my dad and my uncle have lived through uh, from you know, being uh, born and get, being little kids in the Great Depression to World War II and the, the horrible of associated events, uh, all, all the what's happened in the city of Detroit, and they were all in the thick of it. We're going to just uh, cover a few issues, a few a few. Uh, 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 questions go going across that sweep of history, and uh, and they can say whatever they want. This is totally unrehearsed, and they don't know what we're going to ask them. All right, so let's start uh, with uh, at the beginning, I suppose. Your grandparents. It was very interesting to see the Hastings Street video. You grew up really as middle class, uh, really American kids in Detroit. Uh, your uh, your parents were born here. Your mom went to the University of Michigan, which was really something in, in those days. And uh, uh, yet you, you, had, you knew all four of your grandparents, at least dad you knew. I don't know, Uncle Carl, if you knew. Um, no, you didn't, three of the four. So, but tell us about your, your grandparents. And because uh, and, none of them were born in this country, right? So who were they? Well, who goes first? This is the first time in history a member of the Senate at least for 36 years, and a member of the House has shared the same microphone. <laughs> this has never happened before. <laughs> We're not setting that kind of precedent here tonight, I'll tell you. I'll let you have it once a week. Secondly, I want all of us again to join. Uh, I've been through a number of occasions honoring my brother, and I kind of break up. But Carol, congratulations. You deserve every plaudit you've been receiving, every single one. <laughs> By the way, I Mr. Forbes, I never had a yarmulke like that. <laughs> never. Looks good, right? It looks good. OK. Can I borrow it? There's some shadows. <laughs> you know, the movie really um, was very evocative. And I'll say this briefly, very much so. Um, Hastings Street goes well before our time, but a couple of things. All four of our grandparents were born in Eastern Europe, all four. Um, and we know where my maternal, our maternal grandmother was born, in the pale, as I think the others were. By the way, the only thing I would correct in that movie, I think, was the reference to Russia. Because our maternal grandparents spoke Yiddish and Polish. And I don't think they thought of themselves as Polish, but certainly not uh, having come from Russia. Our, we have pictures of where our grandmother, maternal grandmother, was born a little town of Shtetl. I don't think, Carol, we have a picture of, of where our dad's parents were born, a picture of that place, do we? We have a picture of all of them. So I just want to say a word about that, about our maternal grandmother and also uh, uh, our grandfather. Uh, Grandma Gittel, sometimes pronounced Gittel, came over on a boat when she was 15. She spoke no English. She was on a boat all by herself. 
by herself, coming because there were relatives here. And so I think we should all imagine what it was like for a woman of 15 to come on a boat for 10, 15 days, but also what it was like for her parents to send her to the United States of America. She never saw her parents again, as far as I know. So I think that movie is very evocative. And then another thing, our grandfather, I saw some carts there and horses. And uh, our grandpa, Morris, had a little cart in the Birmingham area, after I think Carol may remember her more than I did, first coming to a relative in Bay City. And so he schlepped throughout the Birmingham Troy area. I once had the privilege of campaigning in Troy and going on the doorstep of what was a farmhouse. And I think my, our grandfather had once been on that doorstep. And then as part of the American tradition, he stopped peddling when he had enough dough and opened up the general store in Birmingham on Maple and Old Woodward. Pretty choice spot, right? <laughs> and all I can remember is of that store, Carol, I don't think you were young enough, old enough to remember, was putting my hands in the cookie, in the cookie jar. Cookie jar. Yeah. So one last thing I want to say about, uh, about them. You know, we have some, a cousin here, uh, a judge, uh, others, my, our uncle was a judge. And sometimes it's asked, where do we come from? I think all of us come from two factors within this Jewish community. One was the strong sense of community, of cohesion, and a sense of the importance of community of something beyond ourselves. And secondly, if I might say so, thinking of our grandma Gittel coming here at the age of 15, um, I think it gave us a sense of the underdog. One last thing to this society. One of my greatest regrets, I'm a few years older than Carol, was that I did not talk to our grandparents about their history. I think they were hesitant to talk about it because it was painful, but I regretted not doing that. And so I think what all of you have done with Carol's help more than mine, and I hope to add to it, is the importance of this historical society. Because I failed to ask my grandparents enough about their history. And what this society is really doing is making sure that that mistake, if that is what it was, is not repeated and that we will always know the history of the greatest Jewish community in the United States, the Detroit Jewish community. <laughs> All right, I want to ask Carl a follow-up question. Well, let me, can I add? Well, let me ask you, and then you, so. I'm no longer my, in office, so. I can. Yeah, so, hey. You're, so my generation, I feel, and my son Kobe's here, you know, we get farther and farther from the immigrant experience. But you're, as you spoke about, I didn't know obviously you would do this, you, you married someone whose parents were immigrants. Your grandparents were immigrants. We get farther and farther away. You look at the news today in Europe and, and our own country and this immigration issue is huge. Do you, what, give us some advice about how we can hang on to this thing Dad talked about, about thinking, you know, he had this, your grandmother was 15 years old and what that meant, I mean. Yeah. The advice uh, is simple, just remember where we came from, uh, what the lessons we've learned um, along the journey and uh, what our parents taught us and our grandparents uh, taught us. Uh, never forget the sacrifices which were made so that we could be here, that we could be in America that we could be free uh, 
in America and have opportunity in America. Those sacrifices were made by our grandparents and great-grandparents and by our parents. Um, um, just I want to add a few quick words to what Sandy said to cover uh, the other side of the family a little bit. Uh, our mother, as he mentioned, was born in, well, lived in Birmingham. And she was actually, we think, the only Jew ever born, literally, in Birmingham. <laughs> and by the way... She was born no, in, in her no, home. No, no, in her home. Not in those days. She was born in her home. And her brothers... On Brown Street, right? On Brown Street. Her brothers were born, who obviously lived in Birmingham, nonetheless, after they were born, were actually born in a hospital in Detroit as are most people who live in Birmingham now, not born in Birmingham, but born in Royal Oak or born somewhere else. So now, if you know of anybody who literally was born in Birmingham physically, let me know so I can correct the record. But uh, we think <laughs> our mother was born. And by the way, she did do some oral history with the Birmingham Historical Society. Uh, so she told a lot, uh, filled in hopefully some of the gaps that Sandy mentioned that we, didn't, we weren't wise enough or smart enough or old enough to understand how important it was to talk to uh, our grandparents. On the other side, and by the way, the grandfather that Sandy talked about, who was uh, Morris Levin's son, who was the, that was the maiden name, uh, he was a peddler, as Sandy mentioned. He had a horse and a, a uh, buggy, and he went out in the area, Sandy mentioned, selling threads and spools and needles and things, and then bought that store, as Sandy mentioned, on Maple and Woodward, and then added to it and ended up with three or four stores together, all Levinson. Levinson 5 and 10, Levinson Hardware, Levinson, three or four stores in a row, and we have a wonderful postcard which, with each of those stores uh, on that corner. Sandy and I and our families are still very small percentage owners of some property in Birmingham, so we always ask for tax cuts whenever we can. Um, on, the, on the other, that's a joke. I want to talk about taxes before this, uh, this day is over. I hope one of you asks us about uh, being an American and what our responsibility is to this country. Um, if you don't ask the question, I will ask it of myself later on. But um, the other part of the other side of the family, uh, the Levin side of the family, uh, is Joe and Ida Levin. Uh, they also were born poor, um, born overseas, as Sandy mentioned, in Europe. Uh, Joe was a cigar maker in Chicago when he came here. He also helped to organize a cigar makers union in Chicago, which the cigar maker did not like. And so he was uh, told to leave Chicago, went to London, Ontario with his family, grew to have uh, his family with his wife Ida, had eight kids. So our dad was one of eight children, the second oldest, Ted Levin, whom the courthouse is named after being the oldest. There'd be five brothers and three sisters in that side of the family. But that struggle, that struggle, and it was a struggle. You can imagine a large family in a very tiny house in London, Ontario, uh, was part of the struggle which uh, has been referred to here. Uh, and his effort to organize workers to get better pay and working conditions has been passed on to his family and to our family. That's what Andy did for a long time, was doing some labor organizing. And that belief that you got to help people get a better life and you got to help the underdog it came from the grandparents, their experience in Europe where they were uh, the victims of uh, pogroms and other kinds of anti-Semitic activity. Uh, their um, experience is part was passed on. And one of the reasons I think our people are particularly sensitive to discrimination and to the position of people who have very little is because of the experience of our people. And that's why this society, uh, focusing on our history, is performing a fabulous, I think, service for the Jewish people and for humanity so that these lessons of struggle and opportunity and, and uh, a feeling of how blessed we are that we, our people, our ancestors, were able to get to this country and those who could not and did not. And what our luck is and what their poor luck was in comparison is something that we always have to remember and something that this society, with films such as you saw tonight, uh, will remember, uh, help us uh, all remember. All right, so I'm gonna turn on to Kate, but I have just a, a little note for you all. When you're in Birmingham, 
Go, at, go to the COSI. That's what it is today. Look on your right, to the right of the door, you'll see a plaque that shows the Levinson General Store in the 1890s. And, by, right the, and by the way, uh, uh, our parents are buried in Birmingham, along with our sister Hannah, who we love very deeply, um, and her husband, and Vicki, Sandy's first wife, who passed away now, what, five years ago? Um, were buried in the Chartsetic Cemetery on 14 Mile Road. 14 Mile, yes. 14 Mile in Birmingham. By the All right. way, on, on, uh, another note, you saw the streetcar? You saw in the movie? Our Grandpa Morris, every Thursday, jumped on the interurban in Birmingham to go down to Hastings to get kosher meat. So if you wonder why Carl cares so much about rapid transit, Grandpa Morris had rapid transit back so rapid. in 1898, or maybe the maybe the rapid it came a little later, but not much. <laughs> Judge Avern Cohen is here, and I want to mention one something very quickly about because Avern's our cousin. Obviously, we have a very close family, to put it mildly. Our kids, um, and they're brothers, sisters, uh, and cousins are incredibly close. Just the way we, with our 23 or 4 cousins, when we were young, used to get together all the time, whether it was LaSalle Boulevard, Boston Boulevard, out in Northwest Detroit, wherever it was, the family was extremely tight. And there were 23 cousins, I believe, as well as the eight brothers and sisters and their spouses. They've carried on that tradition of family, too. A word about one more word about my mother's family because incredibly important is the fact that Avern Cohn, who is one extraordinary human being, obviously is a wonderful, wonderful district court judge with all kinds of guts and courage and sense of the importance of the average guy to get a fair break in his courtroom. His father, Erwin Cohn, introduced our parents to each other. You talk about the importance of family. <laughs> but for wherever Avern's sitting out there, but for, <laughs> but for his dad, you know, for better or worse, we wouldn't be here. So. Okay, we're going to try to move on to your childhood growing up in Detroit. And um, we're interested in hearing a little bit of, about what it was like to be um, a Jewish person in Detroit uh, during the war years, both in terms of how you learned about what was going on overseas, but also how segregation, perhaps, of the Jewish community and, um, and anti-Semitism was or was not a, a factor in your childhood, and, and, and how that changed over time. Sandy and I and our sister were raised on uh, LaSalle Boulevard near Grand Boulevard, but about uh, 1940 or so, we moved to Boston Boulevard, uh, had a bigger, much bigger house. Um, and um, we didn't live in the middle of the Jewish community. There obviously were some Jewish families in that area at the time, but most of the Jewish community actually uh, was a little bit to the north and to the west. We went to Central High School, as did Barbara, by the way, and as did our sister. Um, but uh, we, we, had, we faced some anti-Semitism in our neighborhood that I remember. Some kids uh, called us names, as I remember, but not an awful lot. There was a hell of a lot, excuse me, um, anti-Semitism in, in Detroit. I mean, Henry Ford was here. Father Coughlin was here. I mean, we knew all about that from our parents. Uh, our parents were very, very proud Jews, not particularly observant, but very proud Jews. We were bar mitzvahed. Uh, we, Sandy used to walk me to my Hebrew lessons with my head under his arm. <laughs> and and I, yeah, under, yeah, taking me under his wing is right. Um, but, Thanks, uh, Kate. Uh, I, I, when Barb tells me to stand up straighter, I got lousy posture. That is, because he used to walk me to Mr. Goldoftus' house uh, six blocks away with bent over like this. Um, but uh, a couple of things about the war. Sandy mentioned a sense of community. Uh, we have a very strong sense of community in the Jewish community, 
and in the broader community. We're a big part of the broader community and must never forget our responsibility, not just to take care of our own, which we do very, very well, probably better than any other community in the world. By the way, you saw something here about orphans and about seniors. But that's something very, very key to us is to take care of our own. But we have a broader community which we're part of and very proudly part of uh, in America which has given us a haven. We have a responsibility to the broader community as well. But the sense of, of a broader community and being in something bigger than ourselves that Sandy made reference to was dramatized during World War II in a number of ways. We had a job to do, the kids. I was seven or eight during the war, Sandy three years older. And one of the things we did during the war was with our kid, with our buddies in school, we went around looking for uh, cigarette wrappers, gum wrappers, peeling off the foil, making little balls of foil. We all would bring them to school. That would become a box in a homeroom. The school's boxes together would be 40 boxes. The whole public schools together would be tons of foil for bullets and tanks. And we felt we had a role in winning that war. We were six, I was seven years old, he was 10. But we had a role in that war. We flattened cans. We took the paper off the cans and took off the end before we flattened it. I learned that. Took off, take off the other end beside the one you open. And you carry, you know, you carry cans to school by the boxes. That was, we made a contribution. Sandy and I went to camp in Maine in 1933 and 1934, 1943 and 1944. We loved the baseball there. We were, we loved sports. But at least, I think, two or three or four afternoons a week, we picked beans because there was no one to pick the crop because everybody was either off to war or taking the place of someone that was off to war in a shop or in a factory. But we felt part of something that was bigger than us. That's been lost a lot, I believe. And our community is very keenly aware of that importance. We don't laugh at a book that was written by then the first lady, Hillary Rodham Clinton, and she wrote a book that said, It Takes a Village. There were some of the you know, the people who don't believe in the sense of communities that mocked it, saying that doesn't take a village. All it takes is a family, which it does, and, a, and God. That's all it takes, but not a village, not a community. We've learned a lot about the importance of community. So just briefly, especially for uh, some of those who are younger about discrimination, um, it wasn't blatant in the sense that lots of people said things, but it was very, very um, true. Um, we need to remember that in, in this Southeast Michigan, uh, there was a point system in the 50s in Gross Point and if you were Jewish, you could not move there. And if you were an Italian-American, you had points against you. Our beloved Uncle Theodore wasn't able to join either the Detroit Club or the Detroit Athletic Club. Carol and I went to the DAC when we played squash matches. You played for whom? No, we went when, when we played. We played for the Y, but we went. So you to played the on the YMCA team, and they were the other team. Yeah, that's okay. the only the only way we we, we entered the DAC. Um, and when v my beloved wife Vicky and I looked for a house, uh, because of the school system, we decided to look in Oakland County. Um, the broker refused to sell us the house in Royal Oak. And his argument was, we wouldn't feel comfortable. And just the irony, we then bought a house from a woman who was the private secretary to Father Coughlin. <laughs> of all ironies. Thanks a lot. 
No, 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 no. No, no, and she would send us a card. She loved Jenny, who was six months old. It was so ironical. Father Col Coughlin was, uh, was, you know, was a, a ter terrible bigot. And there was immense bigotry in, in this area and a lot of discrimination. I just want to say one last thing about growing up. Wait, before you do, on the house, didn't you take a relative with you to look at the house, or is that an apocryphal story? Did you have help from a relative? Yeah, my father-in-law, heck, I couldn't buy the house without him. And why? Uh, he, he knew the Catholic symbols, right? No, Something. no, no, what was no, it? no, no. There weren't symbols. We just needed his money. Oh. <laughs> 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 All right. Back to childhood. And back to childhood. <laughs> and Mary Lou, you, you knew, you, you, you can identify that. I just want to say one last thing about growing up. Because as I was thinking about tonight, I went through the, some of the editions, the 50 years of the Jewish news, and what awareness there was for people of our age of the Holocaust. Um, as I look back, I think our parents had some understanding of the possible unbelievable horror, but I don't think we began as younger people to begin to have an understanding as to what the cataclysm was in Europe. Because quickly going back, my guess is that except for those of our grandparents who came here and a few who went to Israel, their successors, their children and grandchildren died in the Holocaust. So uh, it's, it's sober, we're all quiet because it's important that we take note and be thankful of where we are today, but also understanding our immense responsibility to carry on the Jewish traditions that were so rich for our grandparents. Okay. All right, well we, go, yeah. One, one quick word about not being aware of the Holocaust, which is very true. Um, there was one thing, though, that we were aware of a few years later, and that was the, the goal of creating a Jewish state in Israel. We were, our parents were strong Zionists. Uh, our dad uh, was a very strong Zionist. Uh, all the magazines that he got uh, related to that dream of creating a state in Israel. My, our mother uh, worked at Adassa as a volunteer, by the way, Volunteers, congratulations uh, for Claremont and Linwood. There's a little bank building there where Hadassah was located. I won't ask you if there's anyone in the room old enough to remember that, but uh, we called ourselves Hadassah orphans because <laughs> when we got home in the afternoon, our mother was usually not there. She was a few blocks away. That's where it was, working at Hadassah. So that was a very, uh, very strong message to us. Uh, in terms of uh, our Jewish background. All right, well, we could talk so much more about that, but we wanted to ask you, as you became uh, young adults uh, and these incredible changes going on in our society, the civil rights movement uh, was going on. You both, uh, I think, were involved and, and, and moved by this. So what was your personal experience and, you know, or your feelings about the role of the Jewish community in this, uh, in, in this situation? Well, uh, let me just do this briefly because um, we probably are going to run out of time. So I'll just give you one example. By the way, the three heroes in our house, and some of you may not uh, fully agree, those of you who go back far enough, but this is true, were Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Hank Greenberg, and Joe Lewis. <laughs> and, and so I'll just give you one example. Um, um, we, we received the, 
uh, monthly the um, NAACP magazine. This was long ago, but uh, the crisis. I remember so vividly what happened, my, our parents' reaction when uh, Marian Anderson wasn't allowed to sing at the Hall of the Daughters of American Revolution. Remember, some of you, a few of you are old enough to remember that. And our parents just thought that wasn't America. And so when she later sang, um, it was an immense emotion. Um, so that's, that's one example, and I think it picks up what Carl said. The sense of community that we were raised with was very strong internally and also was, was reflected externally because there was a sense, and I guess it maybe went back to our grandparents who came from Europe. They knew what it was like. Our grandparents were not citizens. Uh, uh, you know, the, the passport said Jewish. Our grandparents were, weren't citizens of Poland or Russia. It changed three or four times when they were kids, probably. And so I think they had the strong sense that you needed to expand your sense of community. So that's an answer. I remember so vividly Uncle the Mary Carl. Anderson. Let me add on the civil rights uh, issue. Um, Sandy uh, went down to Mississippi, I forgot what year it was, uh, to march and to support the voting rights effort for African Americans uh, in Mississippi. John Lewis, who's his buddy and colleague in the House of Representatives, is famous for leading that march at that bridge, at the Pettus Bridge down in uh, Alabama. In Alabama. Sandy, what year did you go down to Mississippi? 71. Uh, I became the first general counsel to the Michigan Civil Rights Commission you know, back in 1960, uh, 1964, when the Michigan Civil Rights Commission came into existence. And our first case that we brought to establish the jurisdiction under the Michigan Constitution against bigoted officials using their office for discriminatory purposes was against Mayor Orville Hubbard. And so... The mayor we, of Dearborn. Mayor of Dearborn. And so, uh, you know, I was the guy who took that case to court. It's a, it's a story which we could spend time we don't have on, so I'll leave it at that, um, other than to say that it's not a coincidence it's not by chance that Sandy is down in Mississippi supporting voting rights during the civil rights years or that I became the attorney for the Michigan Civil Rights Commission, uh, taking on Hubbard and taking on housing discrimination, by the way. If you can imagine this, the first case on housing discrimination, Hubbard's, by the way, Hubbard's violation was using public property having a bulletin board in the, in the uh, entryway to City Hall where pictures of African Americans who got in trouble were clipped by him. It wasn't in his private office, it was on public property showing every time he could get a clipping with an African American doing something bad and there was a picture of that clipping went up on a bulletin board. So we reproduced the bulletin board, ordered him to take it down. He contested the case and finally, um, on good advice of his attorney, decided he would throw in the towel, and he did, accepted the jurisdiction of the Michigan Civil Rights Commission. All I'm saying, though, I guess the point being here is that it wasn't by chance. Our parents understood what it was like to be an underdog. Our grandparents understood. Our great-grandparents understood what it was like to be poor, to be kicked around, to be discriminated against, to have a Father Coughlin or whoever around, or to have a czar who... Uh, would uh, destroy Jewish communities. That runs in our blood. That's something which we have passed on to our children. Take a look at the work that they've been involved in, and we have no doubt will pass on to their children. And we think it's important that the work that the historical society does is in part passing along that message of believing that everybody in this country has got to be treated fairly. That's what we came to this country for. That's what we've been blessed 
for the most part, by having. Hey, hey. You know, our mother would never take credit. So just quickly, in 1984, um, she only lived a short time after. She came to Washington. Uh, Carol and I were being sworn in at the same time. And it was around that time that she was asked, what do you think of having two sons, one in the Senate and one in the House? That hasn't really happened from the state, same state ever. Her answer was, well, if that's what they would like to do, it's okay with me. <laughs> All right. Sandy mentioned Joe Lewis. I want to tell you a story about Joe Lewis, what a hero he was. <laughs> Joe Lewis had his uh, trainer lived, uh, I think, on Edison or Atkinson in Detroit. And we knew, I knew, and the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame knew that his trainer owned the glove that knocked out Max Schmeling. A physical glove. And every one of you should know, and I think most of you do know, what that fight meant to America and to the Jewish community to knock out Hitler's fighter. Now, Hitler, Schmeling, as it turned out, wasn't himself a bad person. He became friends with Joe Lewis later on. But Hitler, of course, said no Negro will ever beat a German. And we were all listening to that fight, believe me. But that glove was obtained, and I worked hard to help get that glove from his trainer. But the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame got that glove from that trainer, and it, now if you go down to Cobo Hall, you will see it encased in glass. Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. Glove that knocked out Max Schmeling. It's a stunning, stunning exhibit. Are you gonna finish it up? Yeah. Right, so we have, we have two things we have to ask you to cover very quickly, Dad. Um, one is your interest in bringing a Reconstructionist congregation to the city of Detroit before there was one in partnership with many good friends. And the other last thing you need to touch on is the Grandpa Ben story about what it means to be grateful to be in America. I think that's the last question you wanted me to ask you about taxes. Oh, ta oh yeah, I said earlier today I wanted, but I don't think we ought to end on taxes uh, probably. <laughs> Okay, I, I won't end on it. It'll be the second from the last uh, story. Uh, Barb's dad, Ben, and Esther was his beloved wife, but Ben felt very strongly about being in America, what he owed to Uncle Sam. And he, he knew he wasn't going to pay an estate tax. He couldn't figure out why he was getting Social Security. By the way, we got the Baums back here, Marty and Marcia, who are... Barb's cousins, we shouldn't probably start singling out people, but they, they've heard this story a hundred times, so I'll apologize to them. Ben, ben was a small businessman. He was, he was successful, never understood why is he getting Social Security. He didn't need it. We explained to him why he was getting Social Security, but he felt a debt to this country. And in his will, he knew he wasn't going to pay an estate tax. He knew he wasn't wealthy enough to do that. But in his will, he left a bequest of $10,000 to his Uncle Sam. <laughs> I tell that story whenever I hear people, particularly if there are people who are wealthy people, who spend an awful lot of time trying to avoid paying taxes. Now, I'm working at a law firm, which probably helps some of those folks now <laughs> do exactly that. That may be the other side of the story. But as a senator, I can tell you, for the last five years, I have spent going after tax avoidance loopholes and schemes where people try to avoid paying taxes. That's, that's, that's the Ben story, the debt that we owe. And the idea some people leave this country to avoid paying taxes, actually leave America? Have you read stories about some of these guys? Have you read stories about the companies that Sandy's an expert on this and they invert, become owned by a small company? company in some other country so that they can pretend they're not an American company to pay taxes. All right, enough on taxes. I'll end on a different note. And that's the effort that a number of us made back in 1961, I think, and Barb was a, 
not, it must have been later because we were married at the time. 71, maybe. Early 70s. No, no, it was in the mid 60s, I think. Anyway, we were living on Renfrew. We just starting a family. We decided two things. We wanted there to be a um, synagogue in Detroit. We had that downtown synagogue, which is great, but it didn't have, for instance, holiday services. It, they didn't. On high holy days, there were no services in the city of Detroit at the time. And we wanted to keep a Jewish presence in Detroit where we could observe Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, for instance. And so we decided to form a synagogue that would have that function. It was, a reconstru it was based on reconstructionist principles, which are, for those of you who might not know, are kind of close to conservatism. Um, and that, uh, we held it held on there for quite some time, uh, and then about whatever year it was, Carol Weisfeld was there, the Shanks were there, I think we decided that many of us wanted to keep that presence in Detroit because that was a major part of why we formed that congregation. And the other part of our congregation decided that they were gonna have a suburban location, which was fine. So like all great Jewish synagogues, we split. Um, <laughs> Very amicable, but we split. So now they took the name, the original name, went to the synagogue in the suburbs, which is Tahia. Oak Park, Tahia. Yeah. Tahia, Reconstructionist Synagogue. We have a new name, a Reconstructionist Congregation of Detroit, or RCD, which is very much here tonight, by the way. I thank my colleagues from RCD uh, for supporting this dinner tonight. Um, uh, Matt Schenk is our president. Alan Schenk, his dad, was our president. Carol Weisfeld was our president. Alan Schenk is also teaching a tax course with me at Wayne Law School. He's going to teach what the tax code provides. I'm going to teach what the loopholes are that have been found in the tax code. It's going to be an interesting course. Um, and th I guess that's the story of RCD. Okay, but this is a good place to close because, as Andy said, I mean, as Carol said, it's split, and now Andy is president of... Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> He's going to be president of that shul that split off. So the Levin family tries to cover all bases. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. We've enjoyed it. Thank you. All right, Mickey.